We're going to get started. I wanted to welcome everyone to tonight's webinar. I am your host, Dr. Lauren Levine. As of this morning, we had just around 1,000 people that are registered for the webinar. I see a lot of people are here right now. A lot of people are logging in. I'm only going to speak for a few minutes. Uh, I want to make sure that Dr. Kaczynski can speak for as long as he needs, and we also want to make sure we have time for questions at the end. I'm sure some of you are looking at the webinar saying, oh, I know this guy. I've heard Dr. Kaczynski speak before, and oh, gee, this, this is a topic that's familiar, and you know, this is probably the same stuff. And I can guarantee you, having been to and hosted uh, well over a dozen of, of Dr. Kaczynski's webinars, that is not the case. Uh, you're going to be seeing new slides, new cases. It's all new stuff. So if you do have a question, most of you have been on webinars in the past, um, on your screen you have a little box, it's the go to webinar control panel. You can just go ahead and type your questions there as you think about them. I don't normally interrupt uh, him while he's speaking. He typically speaks for 45 to 55 minutes or so. Uh, but put your questions in there. We're going to do our best to get as many as we can. Uh, that's not normally the case that we can get to all of them. And I apologize ahead of time. Listen, when you have a thousand people on a webinar, it's hard to get to all the questions in 15, 20 minutes. Um, within the next couple of days, you'll receive a few things. This webinar, like all webinars we do, is recorded. Uh, our sponsors tonight, Golden Dent, will send out the recording sometime in the next day or two. Um, you know, during the, the webinar, Dr. Kaczynski will be demonstrating a number of products that he uses, such as forceps and bone grafts. A number of these things are exclusive to Golden Dent, and I wanted to thank them. Golden Dent has sponsored a number of webinars with, uh, with us in the past. Uh, we've, it's an ongoing series of webinars that they're providing. They have this fantastic commitment to dental education and uh, just really appreciative of, of all their efforts. At the very end, uh, Kurt Lawler's gonna come on. He will make, uh, as usual, a very nice uh, special offer to everyone who's on the webinar tonight, as well as talk about some of the educational opportunities you have to learn some of the things that Dr. Kaczynski will show you tonight. Um, if you are attending live, you will receive a CE certificate. Invariably, after I do one of these webinars, I get a dozen or two emails from people in the next day or two saying, when am I gonna get my CE certificate? We have a thousand people registered. It takes a long time for them to go through that list and make sure, you know, make sure someone's not trying to game the system by going on for one minute and looking up. You'll get your CE certificate. It can take a few weeks. So I just ask you to be patient. So with that out of the way, I wanna to get to Dr. Kaczynski's uh, CV, but I'm gonna read it kind of quickly because if I read the whole thing, we're not gonna have any time left for the webinar. Um, he is an affiliated adjunct clinical professor at the University of Detroit Mercy School of Dentistry. He serves on the editorial review board of Reality and the Mich Mich Michigan Dental Association, serves as the associate editor of the National AGD. He's past president of the Michigan Academy of General Dentistry. He got his DDS from University of Detroit and his mastership in biochem from Wayne State University School of Medicine. He's a diplomat of the American Board of Oral Implantology and Implant Dentistry, the ICOI, and the American Society of Osteointegration. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Implant Dentistry. He got his mastership in the Academy of General Dentistry. Uh, Dr. Kaczynski has received many honors, including fellowship in the American and International College of Dentists and the Academy of Dentistry International. He's placed probably well over 14, 15,000 dental implants. He's published uh, close to 200 articles on the surgical and prosthetic phases of implant dentistry and has been a contributor to several textbooks. He lectures extensively around the U.S. each year. So, you know, if you're going to an upcoming meeting, see if he's on the schedule. There's a good chance that he may be. So that's a lot, uh, Tim. We are so looking forward to your fantastic information and take it away. Thanks, Lauren. I, I truly appreciate the, uh, you hosting another, another uh, exciting program. Um, you know, as you know, um, I, love, I love sharing the information that we're able to, to create here. And um, Lauren, you know, as, as we've talked about before, I'm a general dentist um, here in Detroit. Um, but we, we have a very, very, we're very fortunate to have a, um, a wonderful thriving implant practice. Um, but when uh, when Kurt Kurt Lawler from Golden Dent asked me to to do a program, I thought, well, let's do something a little bit different than our normal just extraction and grafting. And one of the hot topics I found um, out there is um, 
a grafting and immediate placement of implants. And that's something that, that I really um, feel strongly about. We have great, great successes with it. And uh, I'd, I'd like to preface by saying, you know, there, there's a hundred ways of doing what I do. Uh, and there's not a right or wrong. So what I'd like to share with our, with our attendees today is things that work very, very well for me. A recipe, so to speak. So um, enough, enough of that. I know we're going to show a lot, of, a lot of clinical applications of uh, different materials and different techniques that I use. I know we, the last uh, webinar we did was on suturing, which was, which was a big hit. Um, which, which surprised me. So uh, there's, there's a lot of, lot of information to share to make us really predictable and efficient and, uh, and capable practitioners to provide the, the best, best service we can. So we're, we're gonna talk about, about placing implants uh, immediately following uh, extraction and grafting procedures. And um, I, I think it will be very helpful to very briefly, let's look at the objectives tonight. Um, we'll very, very, very briefly demonstrate a traumatic extraction techniques using um, the Golden Vent Physics Forceps. This is not the program um, that, that you will normally see, but I think it's important. It's the, really the foundation of my practice. The, the Physics Forcep is, a, is an integral part of my practice, and I don't think a day goes by that I don't use the forceps for what I call atraumatic extractions. I know I've been criticized for that term in the past, if you want to call them minimally traumatic extractions. Um, but when we talk about atraumatic extractions, I'm talking about trying to maintain uh, the facial plate of bone to make it um, uh, uh, truly a four-walled socket, which makes uh, immediate placement of implants and our grafting procedures quite routine. But oftentimes we do fracture the facial plate of bone with our extraction techniques. And so I want to demonstrate in detail how I'm able to uh, grow a facial plate of bone very, very predictably uh, with the different materials uh, that I like to use uh, in, my, in my practice. Um, we'll talk about socket preservation techniques, but not so much as, as a precursor to implant placement, but rather as an adjunct to immediate implant placement. Um, site preparation for implant placement, this is not an implant uh, placement uh, webinar. Uh, but we, we, will we will demonstrate uh, briefly some of the techniques that we use to, to gain initial stability uh, and to uh, properly position our implants uh, in socket sites to, to eventually be able to load and create emergence profile and smile design. And um, I always try, as you know, Lauren um, and Kurt, try to, to demonstrate a step-by-step -step process of, of predictable healthy results for our patients. Again, a recipe, so to speak, to, to really create the, the best uh, treatment for your patient and to make it uh, financially rewarding for you. Um, and then finally, the, the topic today is immediately placing implants in our, in our immediately grafted sites following our atraumatic extraction. So you've, many of you have seen this slide before, and you know here we are in Detroit, and, and we see patients like this just about every day. Uh, we're in the suburbs of Detroit, um, an affluent area, um, but we often see people that are really in need. And you might say, how, how can this be? How can people walk around like this? Well, you know, there, there's a lot of reasons, uh, financial reasons, stress reasons, fear of the dentist reasons. Maybe people take care of uh, their family first. But when, when the time comes for patients to accept treatment, uh, this is something that I think that every general dentist out there has to feel comfortable doing. But removing teeth is one thing, uh, but building the bone and preparing sites for future implants is as critical as anything in today's environment. Implant dentistry is, is mainstream today. And you know, all of you there listening today know that your patients are asking you about this, this exciting, innovative uh, mode of treatment. It's not like it was when I was a young man where it was experimental and things like that. It's, it's fairly mainstream. So I challenge all of you out there to get as much education as possible. And I know uh, Kurt will demonstrate some of the programs that, that we do at our University of Detroit Dental School where you're able to actually work on, on patients, not only for extraction techniques, <coughs> but for grafting. And even um, Dr. Nazarian does uh, some implant training um, there also. So what does it mean? It means extractions, grafting, immediate implant placement, abutment, crowns, 
It's a huge potential for your practice uh, of huge financial, and it's also very, very professionally rewarding for you to be able to implement what I'm going to show you in the next uh, 50 minutes, 55 minutes um, in your practice. And I hope you can appreciate that. So very briefly, let's talk about atraumatic extractions. Uh, there's lots of ways to remove a tooth. Um, uh, we're all trained a little bit differently. I do training programs all over the country right now, Lauren. Um, and I see how, how different, different uh, practicing dentists uh, approach removing teeth. However, I also see in my practice many, many, many left root tips. Uh, what does that mean to me? It means that taking teeth out is very stressful to the dentist. It can be challenging, it can be difficult, and we often have a myriad of, of different instruments to help us remove teeth. But I also am very aware that often many of us get very frustrated and we end up giving up and leaving root tips. That's hard for me because I have to remove those root tips before I can place dental implants. So let's go in with the idea that we're going to, to um, remove the teeth in total, try to make it as minimally invasive a procedure as possible for our patients. Let's show you what I do in my practice just about every day. So the physics forcep, again, uh, Kurt can demonstrate this a little bit later. It's a series of four instruments, an upper right, upper anterior, upper left, and a lower universal instrument. Oftentimes, these are the only instruments that I'll use to remove a tooth. And um, it is a lever. It consists of two, uh, two components, a beak, which is a shovel-shaped edge, which will engage the lingual or pal palatal aspect of a root one to three millimeters subgingival. It is the working end of the instrument. We must create tension on this beak area to get the tooth to luxate up and out of the socket. The bumper, and you can see in this photo, the upper area of this, this photo with the green little silicone covering is not the working end of the instrument. It's, it is actually just a center of rotation for this innovative lever to work. It's not holding the facial plate of bone. It's only acting as a center of rotation so that we can create energy on the palatal aspect of this tooth. That energy will result in a physiologic reaction where an enzyme will be released by the body, which will break down the periodontal ligament. What's holding that tooth in place? The periodontal ligament. If the periodontal ligament is destroyed, that tooth will luxate up and out of the socket following the arc of rotation of that instrument. Again, uh, Golden Dent has some wonderful full day programs at our University of Detroit Dental School. Uh, and I advise that those of you who are interested in getting very, very proficient at the use of this instrument, an instrument that I use consistently in my practice, that is probably the best way to learn. Um, we don't ever squeeze the instrument. It is not a forcep. I wish we didn't call it a forcep because it's simply a lever, again, creating energy on the lingual or palatal aspect of a tooth. So there's no forearm, there's no bicep, there's no shoulder pressure whatsoever. So it is an instrument that is very efficient, very effective, and also is atraumatic to the dentist, um, uh, where you're saving your body, saving your hands um, for, for, uh, for the future. It's also atraumatic to the patient. This instrument is, is an instrument that the response that I will often get from my patients is, you're kidding, you're, you're, you're done? because patients are apprehensive about an extraction. And when we are, our standard techniques where we're, we're squeezing and pulling and tugging and figure eighting, we're moving that head around, that in itself is traumatic to the patient emotionally. So this is an instrument that I think you will find very effective in your practice. Let's move on to some clinical applications. Here we have two teeth that were deemed non-restorable from our endodontist. Uh, don't we all love posts? Uh, I probably do more implants on teeth that have posts than anything else. And we oftentimes will see a, a horizontal fracture um, at the post line. And um, we are going to actually have to remove these teeth. Well, what are we going to do when we remove them? Here I'm taking my physics forcep and I'm going to do my a traumatic quote unquote extraction techniques where I'm engaging the beak of the instrument one to three millimeters subgingival on the palatal aspect of this particular root. I'm putting the bumper as high up the vestibule as possible, never squeezing the instrument and simply rotating my wrist towards the corner of the eye. 
This is going to create the energy that is going to luxate that tooth up and out of the socket, um, up and out of the socket. And the instrument is not intended to remove the tooth in total. Rather, it's intended simply to, to break down the periodontal ligament. I will then take what we call a tooth delivery instrument. And it's simply a bird beak uh, forcep, and the tooth will come up and out of the socket. And we remove a two-rooted uh, first bicuspid tooth, again, atraumatically in a matter of seconds, if not minute or so. Now, we have to evaluate this site. Let's all look at this very, very carefully. Okay, it looks like we have a nice clean socket. Sure, Dr. Kaczynski, we did a nice atraumatic extraction, but we must evaluate that socket uh, carefully. So what I would suggest that you do is, um, and, I, and I think Kurt will have uh, a, a, my grafting kit, a grafting kit that we put together, some instruments that I think will be very helpful for you. We want to evaluate the facial plate of bone. Um, we take a periapical radiograph, digital radiograph. Okay, it looks like the teeth are gone. There's no roots there. But we have missing facial plate of bone. Not that I damaged it, not with my extraction techniques, but rather it was destroyed because the facial plate of bone was very thin and that fracture uh, um, resulted in loss of the facial plate of bone. So here I'm taking an Orban knife and, and Kurt, I think you'll have this in, in the surgical kit and I'm making a nice clean incision so that I can create a, what I like to call a envelope flap. So I am not making any vertical incisions in my reflection of this, these two sockets. I'm simply elevating. Now, this is something very important. You have to feel comfortable peeling this tissue away as if you were peeling an orange, so to speak. I need to see the entire defect. However, I do not want to incise into mucosal tissue. Once you incise, cut into mucosal tissue, the patient will experience postoperative discomfort to a serious level because histamine and prostaglandins are released, it's a physiologic reaction. However, if I do not incise into that uh, mucosal tissue, my patients, I'm telling you very honestly, do not experience postoperative discomfort to any high degree. I will give 600 milligrams of ibuprofen three times a day as needed for discomfort. And it is amazing the response you will get from your patients. You're kidding, the tooth is out, You'll call that patient that evening, Dr. Kaczynski, this is great. I really don't experience a lot of discomfort. So patient management, soft tissue management is a critical aspect. So you can see I'm taking a periosteal elevator, again, in my surgical kit, and I'm elevating that tissue beyond the defect. Beyond the defect is the uh, important sentence here. I'm gonna do that facially and palatally. You must feel comfortable doing this. But you can see there's not a lot of bleeding. There's, there's a good control of the soft tissue. As if you had a number 10 envelope and you blew into it. So you're opening the area up because if we're missing a facial plate of bone, I can grow, you can grow a facial plate of bone predictably. I'm going to say 100% of the time if you follow the, the recipe that I'm going to give you. We must protect any graft material from invagination of epithelium. Epithelium grows about 10 times faster than bone. Bone will heal from the apex towards the crest. Epithelium will grow from the crest towards the apex, and it's a race, and tissue will always win. So what we will do is we will protect that grafted material with a membrane, a Band-Aid, so to speak, that will prevent invagination of the epithelium into the grafted material. That allows osteoclasts to invade and osteoclasts will stimulate osteoblastic activity and the material that you are placing into that socket area will, will conform or create new bone over a period of time, usually three, four, five months um, to period of time. So again, this is not an implant training course, but I, you can see I immediately placed implants into those sockets. But you can also clearly see, I have no facial wall on my implants at all. I have initial stability. The stability of an implant comes from the apical two millimeters of any implant system. Um, so I'm getting initial stability, initial torque, so to speak. But you can see I have a definite defect, both palatally and facially. I have no facial plate or bone. So what happens with bone loss? 
what happens if we had just taken these teeth out and left it? Well, you're going to get decreased width of bone. You're going to get vertical height loss. You may get muscle attachment near the crest of the ridge. You can get uh, elevation of the prosthesis a la a denture. Um, with residual ridges, you can get paresthesia. The face can collapse. You know that when teeth are lost, bone is going to shrink up and in in the upper jaw and down and in in the lower jaw. You've all seen it. You've seen that, that, that concavity on the facial aspect. Bone needs to be stimulated. All skeletal bone demonstrates volume stability over time, except what? Our dental alveolar bone. Because the dental alveolus is very labile in the absence of loading. So I'm loading this area. I'm loading it with our dental implant. I'm trying to minimize or prevent further bone loss by stimulating that bone and eventually putting nice, some nice um, uh, emergent profiled crowns. Bone grafting is possible because our bone tissue, unlike any other tissue, has the ability to regenerate completely if provided the space into which to grow. As native bone grows, it will generally replace the graft material completely, resulting in a fully integrated region of new bone. The biologic mechanisms that provide a rationale for bone grafting are osteoconduction, osteoinduction, and osteogenesis. Again, we can grow bone predictably. You can also. So with grafting at the time of extraction, again, we can prevent bone loss, we can support the soft tissue, we can prevent periodontal pathology, and we can provide adequate sites for implants in 12 to 16 weeks if we, if we do socket preservation. And in these situations, we're gonna immediately place an implant and grow bone around it. Without, uh, without grafting, the literature will say we'll get 30 to 60% bone loss um, over, over a few years period, which means that you may need more invasive procedures, more, more grafting, more invasive grafting procedures to be able to put our implants in the future. Socket grafting failures are due to several things. You know, not, I don't do every case that comes to the door some. Um, I, what I want to leave you with today is sockets where all the walls are intact and sockets where the facial wall is missing. That's what I, that's my bread and butter in my practice. When more than two walls are missing, that's where I will have my oral surgeon do a uh, autogenous uh, block graft in a certain area. Suturing is very important. I love the last uh, webinar that we did, Lauren. Um, I think suturing techniques is very important. We will demonstrate that a little bit. I mentioned that a membrane is like a, a, a barrier or a Band-Aid that will prevent invagination of epithelium. That membrane has to be passively placed and it must remain in place for at least, at least six weeks. At least six weeks. I know many of you have done grafting procedures before and have had mixed results. Why? Because the membrane is, is gone over a, period, a shorter period of time. You either use a membrane that isn't intended to last that long, a, a collagen membrane um, that only lasts a week is not, is not a membrane that's going to protect the graft material for a six week period. Or we don't suture it properly and it is dislodged by the patient or upon suture removal. So it's important that we use the correct materials that I'll demonstrate in a little bit. Infection, we must clean the site. When we do an extraction, we must curette, 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 curette. So again, I challenge you to get a good surgical kit with sharp instruments so that we can eliminate um, infection. If you have an infected site, I will curette. I can graft an infected site and the area will heal, but I never would put an immediate implant in an infected site. I'd rather that it heal first and come back at a future date and place my implant. And our reflection or flap design is very important. As I demonstrated or told you, we want to make that envelope. So we want control of it. We want good blood supply and we want to maximize our results. There are a lot of different membranes on the market today. And my suggestion to you is Kurt will have some specials on his excellent um, a material called EpiGuide, which is a polylactic acid synthetic material great results for 10 years in my hands. And they also have a long lasting collagen membrane 
uh, which is a, a bovine collagen matrix made membrane. The, the point being is both of these membranes are long lasting. They need to last more than six weeks. So if a sales rep comes in and says, oh, I have a membrane that doc that's much less expensive, the question I want you to ask that rep is, how long does it last? If the answer is, I don't know, you don't want it. You want predictability. I want you to be able to grow bone 100% of the time. A lot of different grafting materials. We're going to focus primarily on two. We're going to focus on the Osteogen plug, which is a calcium appetite, bioactive calcium appetite material in a bovine Achilles tendon matrix. And this material will mimic the organic and inorganic components of physiologic bone. Um, the bovine Achilles tendon matrix is simply a collagen carrier, and uh, it allows for a scaffolding uh, for keratinized tissue um, uh, over the top of the, of the uh, we will not get epithelium ingrowth over this material. Uh, the other material that we have is from Golden Dent. It's their allograft material, which is a cancellous um, cortical mixture, 250 to 1,000 microns. It's human bone, very safe, and very, very affordable. Uh, these are the two products that I would suggest that you get. We don't need a lot of different products in your office to get the successes that I'm getting in my practice. So you, we have two membranes and basically two different um, grafting materials. Um, allograft materials, uh, as we mentioned, and the osteogen bioactive resorbable calcium appetite are the two materials that we will focus on in the program today. So the graft material here is an allograft material from, from Goldoss. Um, it is particulate and I will wet it with sterile water or sterile saline. Do not mix your allograft material with a local anesthetic. Local anesthetic has a very uh, low pH. It's very acidic, which will affect the turnover of, of bone and osteoclastic activity um, in, in bone uh, reformation. So do not use anesthetic, local anesthetic, in your wetting of your material. And it's a, um, uh, a highly, highly, uh, in highly evolved allograft material that's osteoinductive and osteoconductive, uh, which acceler ce accelerates cellular ingrowth uh, over a very, very short amount of time. Again, the, the membranes that we're talking about primarily, we're going to show you the epi epiguide material, which is again a, um, a, a polylactic acid synthetic material, long lasting, very easy to contour, very nice to use. Three layers, long lasting, it's hydrophilic, it wets really well, and it'll allow us to actually build a wall. So here, going back to my case, you can see that I have passively placed this pre-cut membrane beyond the defect. This membrane must extend at least two millimeters beyond the, the defect. This will allow initial stability. I will then use that membrane as my new facial wall and I'm taking my wetted allograft material and building a new wall. I'm then going to fold my membrane over the top, over the crest, onto the palatal surface. Again, it must extend at least two millimeters beyond any defect. This membrane must be passively placed. I'm simply going to suture it. And again, from the last webinar we did with Lauren, you can see my suturing technique. You don't want to go through the membrane. Rather, you want to place the sutures on top of the membrane to hold it down. So you can see my reverse cutting needle, I'm going from crustal to the facial, sliding over the top of my membrane, and then simply turning the needle around and doing the same thing on the palatal aspect, which allows me to get closure. Now, very important, I do not have primary closure here. I think we all agree. How, the reason is I do not want to pull that facial tissue towards the crest. Why? Because again, another rule, attached gingiva on the facial aspect of the implant is essential. I must have at least a two millimeter band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect of any implant for periodontal health. Because these membranes are long lasting, 
a la lasting more than six weeks, epithelium will grow very quickly over the top of it. Epithelium will grow a half a millimeter to a millimeter a day. So when I do suture removal, essentially that epithelium will reconnect and the area will be protected. I let the site, the implants heal in this particular situation for four months. The laboratory then fabricated two nice custom milled uh, abutments. You're looking at my margins are at or slightly subgingival and the laboratory fabricated two nice zirconia bruxer crowns which create function and aesthetics for our patients. So let's keep moving on. We, this is very typical in your practice. Again, we have a tooth that's deemed non-restorable by our endodontist. Um, I think a root canal was, was attempted years ago. Patient has symptoms. Uh, we had calcification of the mesial canals. We had a tooth that was deemed non-restorable um, through the root canal. So the endodontist referred the patient to us for extraction. And what I simply did was I removed the composite material from this old crown. And I took what, uh, it, this is a burr called a Lindemann burr, Lindemann burr um, that I'm using is very pointy and very sharp. And I'm going right through the center uh, of, this, of this crown through the root into the furcation area. And what I want to do is to establish ideal position of my dental implant. Cool technique here. It's a cool trick. Uh, where do I want to place the implant? Well, I wouldn't want to pl place it in the mesial root or in the distal root because then I'm going to have a mesial or distal cantilever in our final prosthesis. In my courses, in my implant training courses, I try to teach you, we're trying to teach you tooth down in this situation when we're talking about implant surgery. We wanna idealize implant placement to maximize the functional and aesthetic result of our implants. So I'm simply creating a purchase point, and now I'm gonna remove that crown. And this is another great instrument. Um, write it down if you're listening, uh, a WAM key. Um, how do you remove crowns at this juncture in your practice? I'm assuming that most of us would take some kind of a burr and cut through the facial aspect of the crown onto the, onto the occlusal, onto the lingual, take some type of luxator, and usually the distal portion of the, of the crown comes off, and then we try to flick the mesial section off. How do you remove a, a, a bruxer zirconia crown? <coughs> Challenging, uh, difficult, expensive burrs. So here I will simply make a, um, an elliptical penetration through the facial aspect of my crown. I'm assuming that preparation is about uh, two or three millimeters from the occlusal surface because you have a, a preparation there. And I'm simply uh, taking a burr and making a little elliptical window. And I'm going to take this really innovative wham key. It's just magic. Anything that saves me time in my practice is financial rewarding to me. I'm simply going to insert the key through the crown and rotate my wrist and the crown will come off. Now I have my crown and I'm going to section it and remove the mesial and distal root as if they were two, as if they were two uh, individual bicuspid teeth. Here's my Lindemann burr again, and this is really ideal position for my implant, right? I'm kind of making my pilot hole with this initial burr. Section, section the roots mesial and distally, make sure they're sectioned completely, and I, then I go to my go-to, my physics forcep, my universal lower, and I'm simply removing it as if it were a single rooted, um, a single rooted tooth. Never squeezing, rotating my wrist towards the shoulder, and the teeth will, the roots will luxate up and out of the socket, creating a relatively atraumatic extraction for the patient, atraumatic to the heart tissue, atraumatic to the patient, and atraumatic to me, the doctor, saving my body. I need to evaluate this site. So again, I'm taking my Orban knife, which is a, a, a really a remarkable instrument, a curved uh, blade, and I'm elevating that tissue, a la the envelope that we talked about, a number 10 that we blow into, trying to eliminate vertical incisions into mucosa. If you don't incise into mucosa, you will not have postoperative discomfort. I'm evaluating the site, and you can see we do have uh, some facial defect, and I'm going to go through my osteotomy preparation. Again, not an implant case, but I want to idealize. I'm thinking tooth down here. I'm thinking crown, not implant placement. I made my initial penetration with my Lindemann burr, and I'm making my pilot hole. I'm going to widen the osteotomy, widen the osteotomy, 
widen the osteotomy. This happens to be the Han implant system from Glidewell Lab, but every system uh, would work to equal you as well. Here's my nice wide dental implant that is threaded into my osteotomy site, creating initial stability because my initial stability comes from the apical two millimeters of my preparation. And I grafted the site. So here I'm taking my allograft from, um, from Goldoss, wetted it with sterile water. I'm grafting around. Now, docs, what do we have to do here? How do I get predictability? How do I know that I'm gonna grow bone? You're gonna place a membrane, a membrane that lasts at least six weeks, and you're going to passively place it so that it extends at least a millimeter beyond any defect facially and lingually. So my membrane is passively placed. Suturing is critical. I wanna make sure that I maintain at least a two millimeter band of, of attached gingiva on the facial aspect of that teeth. I'm not concerned about primary closure. Here's my implant in position. One week suture removal. You can see that we didn't get primary closure. Three months post-op, we get beautiful, healthy primary, we get healthy tissue with a band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect. We can uncover the implant, our healing abutment, and eventually we can make a nice, here, a screw retained uh, Bruxer crown covered over with a composite restoration. Doctors out there, every one of you is capable of providing this quality of care to your patients. It could be an efficient and predictable mode of treatment that your patients are asking you to do. So it's just a matter of educating yourself and making sure that we don't skip any steps in our process. And here's the final radiograph of our uh, amazing uh, single tooth implant restoration in an immediate extracted site. What I like to do is just demonstrate a quick video of extraction and graft. Uh, with an implant. So let's see if this runs okay for us. Here we have a patient that presents with an infected mandibular first molar. You can see on the digital radiograph that we have a significant infection, purulence, and a tooth that is fractured. Endodontic evaluation indicated that we could not um, save this tooth, and so we were going to extract it. When we're working with, on a mandibular molar tooth, um, I like to section these mesial and distal roots completely, um, that will allow me to atraumatically remove the individual roots as if they were bicuspid teeth. It's imperative that you section all the way through the furcation. So when you do this, stop and take a radiograph and make sure that the section is all the way through the furcation. I'm taking a luxator and just making sure that we have complete um, separation of the two roots. Now I'm gonna use my golden dental physics forceps. See, I'm not squeezing the instrument and you can see that roots come up and out of the socket. The instrument is not intended to remove the tooth in total, rather to luxate it one to three millimeters up and out. I'll then take what we call a tooth delivery instrument and simply remove the rest of the root in total without damaging the facial plate of bone. We then have an atraumatic extraction, atraumatic to the facial bone, atraumatic to the patient, and atraumatic to the doctor. There's no forearm, bicep, shoulder pressure whatsoever. You can see that the extraction is clean and neat. We will then curette the area. And here I'm simply going to use the osteogen plug uh, in this site. Um, I cut the plug in half, and I'm simply going to place it into first the distal socket. The nice red, healthy blood is absorbing into the, the, the material, and then we'll do the same thing with the mesial root. And again, blood is just beautifully engaging. I'm placing the, the osteogen graft material into the socket. I'm condensing, but not packing it like amalgam and you can see how the product looks. I'm now going to just simply place a couple uh, interrupted sutures to hold the material in place. I will then tell the patient that the material is white uh, and it's supposed to stay there. I don't want them to think it's um, infected area. And immediately post-operative, you can see the radiograph and you can see a little bit of uh, particulate 
we'll wait three months or so and we'll be able to predictably place a dental implant quite readily. So the second material, we talked about the allograft material. Um, the second material that I just demonstrated is called an osteogen plug, and you can get that through, through Golden Dent also. It is a wonderful material. I've done a lot of histology, a lot of research on it, and I can predictively grow bone in a very short amount of time. Uh, what's nice about this material, it can't be any simpler. It's very cost effective to you in preparation for, um, for future implants. Um, and you don't need a membrane uh, to use it because the, um, because the material, uh, again, uh, the bovine Achilles tendon um, carrier prevents uh, invagination of epithelium. Epithelium will follow the path of least resistance. So I strongly recommend uh, if you talk to Kurt with Golden Dent that you at least try this material. I would, I would strongly recommend you use it for when all the walls are intact initially, um, not when a facial wall is missing. If you want to use it where a facial wall is missing, you have to go back to the, the technique that I demonstrated, that envelope uh, flap, and you must protect it with a long-lasting membrane. So again, um, a material that I find very, very useful. It's inexpensive. Uh, it's used as a, a, for socket pres preservation in a membrane. It has our graft material, pre prevents um, a migration of connective tissue into the surgical site. Um, uh, the epithelials, epithelial cells will grow over the top of it because it'll follow the path of least resistance. So three months post-op, you can see that the material has not integrated completely, but it's different than it was. It's becoming a little bit more opaque. Every person is gonna integrate their bone a little bit differently, but I want you to remember that the physiologic process is we're getting bone turnover from the apex towards the crest, from the apex towards the crest. So we expect to get more uh, radio opacity at the apex than at the crest. Where did I see, let's make a concentric circle here. Where did I see we get our, what, where did I say we got our initial stability of our implant? From the apical two millimeters. So it's fine with, at this juncture for me to go ahead and do my osteotomy and place my implant and allow that implant to heal for, for several more months as this bone continues to turn over over a period of time. So here's my surgical site after three months. We have a band of attached gingiva. And as I mentioned, I do a lot of histology and not to bore you with, with this, but uh, in this situation, the magenta color, the pink color is bone turnover. The purple is the grafted uh, material that has not turned over yet. So you can see in a three month period, I uh, did a core sample, you get tremendous bone ingrowth of the material. So I'm going through my osteotomy uh, uh, protocol. Pilot burr, think, thinking tooth down. Uh, again, not an implant um, uh, course per se, but an immediate placement of an implant that was I was able to torque to at least 25 newton centimeters, which meant I could put an immediate um, healing abutment, which penetrates through the soft tissue. I know we're covering a lot of information here, but we can do a lot of, uh, we can get into more specifics later. You can see this is a very non-invasive procedure, doctor. Every one of you can do this in your practice. There's not a lot of bleeding and there's very little or no post-operative discomfort. After three months of continued healing, and you can see on the, the radiograph on the right, how that bone is turning over. It's looking more mature. We're taking a final impression. The laboratory will fabricate a nice implant retained crown. And, and if you look at the lower left slide, look at the periodontal health that you created, doctor, uh, in your practice and our final, final implant retained prosthesis. So let's compare uh, our two materials here, um, conventional grafting with our allograft material from, from Goldoss and our osteogen plug. We have two teeth, same patient, contralateral sides. We're gonna remove the teeth. They're deemed non-restorable. And I'm going through my process. Uh, this is a periotone from, from Golden Dent. Again, it's a really nice, uh, a nice um, uh, setup. Uh, the blue is a plasma vapor deposit, which makes the, the, um, the uh, tool um, stronger and scratch resistant. And I will use it to simply go between the tooth and the, the thin facial plate of bone, if you so desire. And I go to my go-to, my physics four step. I'm engaging the lingual aspect of each of these teeth 
placing the bumper as far down the vestibule as possible, simply rotating my wrist towards the shoulder. The teeth will luxate up and out of the sockets. I'll take my tooth delivery instrument ad nauseum and remove the teeth and curette, 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 curette. Granulation, purple blood must be removed from your site. Uh, red blood is good. We are going to take a radiograph to make sure that no root tips were left. Please do that. Um, and you can see we have a site. Now, because we have a clean site, and because my initial stability is going to come from the apical aspect of, of my uh, socket, I'm going to go through the osteotomy procedures from a small burr to a wider burr to a wider burr. Again, this is the Glidewell Han implant system, a uh, great system uh, taught, taught by the Mission Institute. We do some training programs around the country on it, um, and we can train you how to be very, very, very functional with this very exciting implant. So pilot burr, widening the osteo osteotomy, widening the osteotomy. As I demonstrated, our conventional allograft material, we're using uh, the gold os material, wetting it, or an osteogen plug. I'm going to simply pack the socket. I've already done the osteotomy, doctor. I've always, already done the osteotomy, or I'm placing my osteogen plug, as I showed you in the little video demonstration. And you can see immediate, placement of my graft material, I will then thread my implant directly into the grafted sites. I will thread the implant directly into the grafted site. And what this is doing is it's pushing the grafted material uh, away from the implant to the walls of the defect. Again, I have all four walls intact in both of these situations. We will place the implant. Now, when we do an immediate extraction, we want to bury that implant about a millimeter subcrestal. This is the only time where we, we will place the implant subcrestal because physiologically, because of the biologic width, we expect to get up to a millimeter of bone loss vertically uh, with these traumatic procedures. I'm torquing the implants into position. And here we're torquing to 35 and 45 Newton centimeters. Uh, so we're getting tremendous initial stability at the apical portion. Again, the implants are placed just slightly subcrestal in good bone with good stability. And because I was able to achieve at least 25 Newton centimeters of torque, again, the literature says that if we get 25 Newton centimeters of torque, we can place what we call a healing abutment. A healing abutment is simply a taller screw that will penetrate through the soft tissue, which eliminates the need for uh, anesthesia and uncovering uh, once the implant has integrated. Uh, on the osteogen plug, I wanted to demonstrate both conditions, and we did put what we call a cover screw or closure cap, which will then bury the implant underneath the soft tissue. The soft tissue will then uh, cover the top of it. So you can see the advantage, uh, healing abutment, we don't have to do uh, secondary uncovering. On the slide on the right, we buried the implant and what's gonna happen is the tissue is gonna grow over the top of that site, which means we're gonna have to use a little local anesthetic and uh, remove that tissue. Radiographs of the two implants in position and we will get integration over a, small, a short period of time. Maxillary anterior, Another situation where we have a tooth that is deemed non-restorable, facial plate of bone is relatively thin. Um, patient uh, would like a dental implant. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna evaluate the attached gingiva. I'm gonna use my uh, physics forcep to atraumatically remove the tooth, take a radiograph to ensure that there's no, um, that there's no um, root tips left. I'm going to curette, 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 curette. Here I do have a facial wall, and I'm going to go ahead and do my osteotomy. Again, not necessarily an implant program here, but positioning of this, of this uh, implant is critical. We want to make our initial penetration not into the socket site whatsoever. Rather, we want to go about three millimeters palatal to the facial aspect of the adjacent teeth, of the adjacent crowns, to allow for fabrication of a custom abutment and eventually um, a, um, a custom uh, aesthetic crown. So I'm going through my osteotomy procedures, pilot burr, 
widening the burr, widening the burr and extending it at least two millimeters beyond the defect to create initial stability. Again, widening it, thinking tooth position first, and you can see my osteotomy is about three millimeters palatal to the facial aspect. I'm, I'm basically placing it where the cingulum area would be. Because I have all my walls intact, I'm simply taking that innovative osteogen plug, placing it into the socket sites, and threading my implant directly into that material, torquing it into position, and you can see I am sub-crestal, about a millimeter or so. Um, because I was able to achieve at least 25 newton centimeters of torque, I'm gonna go ahead and put a healing abutment. And here we made an Essex retainer with the patient's crown that had fractured uh, as a temporary restoration. Post-operative CT for evaluation, I want you to see how we actually placed that implant a little palatal to where the tooth root was, which allows me to have an excess of facial bone, which is going to allow you to have complete control function, smile design, um, and a nice aesthetic final restoration. I allowed the implant to heal for four months. You can see the nice band of attached gingiva. And what I wanna show you something really interesting. Um, I'm often asked, how do, you, how do you know that implant has torqued in place? Hi, I'm Dr. Tim Kaczynski from Bingham Farms, Michigan. And I was asked to demonstrate a, um, a new technique that's very, very helpful in our practice. And that is the use of the penguin RFA um, torque determining device to help determine implant stability uh, with objective measurements. So we have a patient that we um, have a healing implant and I'm simply gonna remove this healing abutment with my little tool. And the implant has integrated for about four months. And then I'm simply going to I'm simply going to take the, um, the, the penguin um, multi-peg and I'm going to thread it into my implant, just hand tighten it, pretty routine, hand tighten, and the penguin unit is self-contained, very easy to transport, and so to take this stability measurement, I'm going to connect this multi-peg uh, to the implant, and then I'm going to turn the the penguin on, and I'm simply going to direct it towards the magnet at the top of the peg. I'm not touching it. The peg is stimulated by magnetic pulses and vibrates due to the stiffness in the contact area between the bone and the implant interface. And you can see our value is 79. The stability of the implant is indicated um, on an ISQ scale of 1 to 99. And by taking a baseline value at implant placement, it really does give us a great um, relationship as far as osteointegration. And generally, values above 70 indicate a very stable implant with low micromobility that can withstand normal function forces in the mouth. Um, and this confirms that um, loading of this implant is appropriate. So I feel really good about it. I'm going to put my abutment and my final crown, and we'll show you that, and we'll be all done. I wanted to show you this because this is something that um, Hi. that um, uh, that Kurt with Golden Dent um, is is selling, and I know um, oftentimes dentists ask me um, dentists with 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 um, that are that are newer into implant dentistry. How do you know the implant's integrated? You know, Dr. Kaczynski, you can say that all you want, but how do I know that it is? And uh, in the past, what we would do is we would take our torque wrench and we would uh, simply engage the implant and, and torque test it using our torque wrench. Now, if that implant moves at all, that implant will fail. And um, I was talking to a dear friend of mine, uh, Dr. Tilly in Pensacola, who, who was having issues with that. And I said, you know, get the penguin. And um, she purchased it. And I think it's just a, been a big asset to her practice. It gives you a lot of confidence to know. Now, what if I didn't get a reading of 60 or 70? Well, then I would, I would just not take our impression, don't invest in the crown, rather um, give it some more time to heal. Everybody's gonna heal a little bit differently. So here to finish the case, we took our impression, we have our impression material. This happens to be uh, Kettenbach material, uh, which is a great product. Um, you can sell direct, and here I'm putting my healing abutment back in. 
you can see the nice periodontal tissue health, putting my abutment in place. We're gonna torque that abutment with the Han system. We're torquing it to 35 Newton centimeters. You have to follow the manufacturer's direction and you can see the final aesthetic, Bruxer aesthetic crown um, for our patient. It's just remarkable dentistry that all of you can provide following uh, proper technique and protocol. Another quick case, we're almost finished here. We'll, we'll, we'll finish up with another uh, anterior case where the facial wall, uh, this is a difficult case, right? I mean, we have a fracture, vertical fracture, or, I'm sorry, a horizontal fracture, a periodontal defect on the, on the distal aspect, a tooth that is non-restorable. We take our physics forcep, engage the, the palatal aspect of the tooth. You can see the pus that's penetrating through. I'm gonna go ahead and remove the tooth with our tooth delivery instrument. Take our radiograph, correct. Do we have a facial wall, doctors? No, okay, so what do we have to do? You know what to do now. We have to be able to see the defect. I have to go beyond, how far beyond the defect? At least two millimeters. What type of reflection are we gonna make? An envelope reflection. Are we gonna to try to incise into mucosa? No, we're not. So I'm taking my Orban, again, that envelope, and you have to feel comfortable peeling it like an orange. I do not have a facial wall here. I think we all agree, but again, going through my osteotomy, and this is, again, not an implant course, but we can train you how to do this. Making, thinking tooth up in this situation, making my initial penetration with my 2.4 pilot burr, where three millimeters palatal, the facial aspect of the adjacent tooth. Why? To get initial stability on the apical two millimeters of our implant. Made my initial uh, direction, I'm gonna widen the osteotomy and I'm going to place my implant. You can clearly see we do not have a facial wall. I'm gonna put my cover screw and bury the implant and I'm gonna take my long lasting uh, pre-cut uh, membrane barrier, band-aid, this happens to be an epiguide material. Where am I placing it? At least two millimeters beyond the defect. To do that, you have to be able to see the defect, doctor. You can't be forcing this. That becomes my new wall. I'm taking my allograft material, placing it on the facial defect, passively layering the membrane over the top onto the palatal surface. Now, what if you don't have enough to cover over to the palatal? You can overlap two pieces, doctors. I'm gonna suture. I don't care about initial closure. and my implant placement, we repaired a lot of the defect and our final crown is a healthy situation. And very, this is the last case that I'm gonna show Lauren and then we can go through questions. This is a more difficult situation where a patient presented a mess. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna remove these teeth and in this situation, I had a, a, a laboratory fabricate a um, removable flipper appliance. No different though, I have to feel comfortable reflecting the tissue. If I can see the defect, I can fix the defect. I place my implants. You can see I have uh, threads exposed on the facial. I'm cutting my membrane. I have to have that membrane passively placed, taking my allograft material, covering it, protecting it, suturing it, allowing the site to heal for a four month period. I'm gonna make my uh, impression. This happens to be a, a Mira tray. I'm often asked what this is. M-I-R-A tray, you can get it from Shine. It's a, um, uh, a, a stock tray that has like, almost like a silicone, like a saran wrap. So when I'm taking my uh, open tray impressions, uh, it's, a, it's a nice, nice instrument. I'm gonna to torque my abutments. This is called a smile composer. We do things in, um, in composite first to establish a proper occlusion and smile design. And we're gonna do a little pink tissue here. And here the laboratory happens to be Glidewell Lab um, out in Irvine, California. They do a great job for me. And our final prosthetic reconstruction that's predictable and functional. Now I'm going to stop there, um, Lauren. If you have uh, 
I'm right into an hour, so we have plenty of time for questions, and then we can, uh, uh, I could go for another hour if you wanted me to, but um, let's stop here. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, that's, that would be, I think that'd be great, but I'm not sure if everyone would, <laughs> would work. So um, at this point, what I want to do before we get to the Q&A is, is turn the screen over to, to Kurt Lawler. As I mentioned, we are, are very fortunate to have uh, Golden Dent sponsor these webinars. You know, it's, it's not overkill to say if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be able to put together this webinar. They always are kind enough to present a, um, a special offer as well as talk about some of the educational opportunities they have available. So uh, Kurt, take it away. All right, thanks, uh, Laura, I appreciate it. Let me uh, get back here to the beginning of the slide. All right, um, I know we have a lot of uh, doctors that join our webinars on a regular basis and we always appreciate that. And I'm sure there's also some uh, new doctors on this evening, so um, welcome and, and hopefully you can join one of our future webinars. Um, just a little bit about Golden Dent. We're a Detroit-based uh, company that operates under the principles of providing uh, simple, predictable, and unconventional solutions, which started with the physics forceps back in 2007. Um, but we rely on over uh, 80 years of uh, dentistry in our family here in Detroit to manufacture products that um, are different or unconventional, but also clinically work. Um, so that's kind of what we do. We don't have a huge portfolio of products. We just add products that we believe um, add value to the dental office for our customers. Um, as mentioned, I um, do provide a promotional offer um, for anybody that joins the webinar this evening. We appreciate you investing your time with us. And I know we go over various different techniques and, and there's obviously products always involved in, in how you do a technique. And if anybody is interested in, uh, whether it's the Orban knife or the, the physics forceps or some of the products I'll show here in a second, um, you do get a promotional offer um, this evening, which is shown on the screen. So we're, we're doing 11% promo code this evening. Um, it's golden-dent.com or uh, physicsforceps.com. We'll also take you to the same place. And it's, um, the code is SCREW11. And I'll, I'll show this again here in a minute. Um, we do this for uh, one day. We do a quick promotional offer. Um, so anybody that's joining this evening, the promotional offer expires tomorrow, the 25th of September. So if you do want to take advantage of it, uh, give us a call in the office or take a look uh, online this evening. So this is what started our company in 2007. This is the standard series physics forceps. I know uh, a lot of doctors that are on this evening are already existing customers, uh, happy users of the product. Um, or if it's something that's new to you, this is our most popular set of instruments. This is called the standard series. You have three upper instruments and one lower instrument. So you have an upper right, upper left, upper interior, and one lower universal. This is the most popular set. Um, it's easiest to use. You get the best leverage. Um, the design of this really has not changed um, since the beginning. Um, like I said, back in 2007, about 12 years ago. And uh, these are, are proven to work. Um, they're very popular with a lot of dentists, um, like Dr. Krasinski, and used properly and not treated like a forcep. Um, you will have great success with this. As shown in the, uh, the with the standard series, you're only going to be able to get back to uh, the second molar and, and forward, so to speak. Um, you're not going to be able to get back to a erupted wisdom tooth. And sometimes you may not be able to get to the second molar, depending on the access. So we also do have a, a second set of instruments here, which is called our molar series. Um, one instrument's used for like the upper right and the lower left, and then the other instruments for, for the uh, upper left and lower right. Uh, they go straight in the mouth, and it's sort of like turning a round doorknob in slow motion. Again, you're not gonna squeeze, but this gives you a little bit further um, access to go further back in the mouth. But with that said, you do lose a little bit of your leverage with this instrument. So if you're new to the physics forceps, we really always recommend to start with the standard series and uh, see how those work for you because you always have the 90-day uh, trial with, with the product. This is the uh, kit. I uh, went ahead and, and put this in here because Dr. Krasinski uh, mentioned it a couple of times this evening and I specifically um, put the Orban knife there at the bottom just to take a little closer look as to what it looks like. Um, I know that's an instrument that Dr. Krasinski really likes, but this is the uh, simple graph kit. Um, it's nice to have everything in one place. Um, it has your uh, simple hemostat scissors, uh, bone file, curette, orban knife, parasol elevator, 
uh, your graft dish, and then the uh, the blade blade holder or the scalpel. So it's it's a simple kit. Comes in a cassette. You can keep it together. It looks nice. Um, it's not too expensive. You can find that um, on our website under our uh, regenerative instrumentation. The plugs. So if anybody's not using the plugs or um, just wants to take advantage of the special this evening, if you're already using the plugs, I would encourage that. Um, very very popular product for us. Um, very, uh, we have a lot of really happy users. I know Dr. Kaczynski showed it this evening. I know he's been using it for quite some time with great success. Uh, it's less than $50 per use, no membrane. Uh, comes in two sizes. Uh, I would recommend the large. That's usually the more popular size. You can always cut it to shape. Uh, but it also comes in a slim for more uh, anterior uh, teeth, which is the uh, six millimeter by 25 millimeter shown there on the screen. Um, again, it's, it is a bone graft, so it's not a collagen plug. It's not the same thing as Jamerita Foundation. Um, it's a synthetic bone and a bovine collagen carrier, so it absolutely is a bone graft. So for the uh, other cases where uh, maybe there's a defect and you're going to use a membrane and an allograft, uh, the Golas brand is our, our brand of allograft, and it is a great allograft. We've had this for a number of years now, and uh, I think you'll find the pricing pretty competitive if you are using a different brand. Um, we, we encourage you to take a look at our allograft. We'd love to have you as a customer and, and provide the support we provide in our office to, to help you with any clinical questions you may have. Um, that's one great benefit of our company is we're there to help you. We always answer the phone. We're there to uh, respond very quickly and uh, answer any questions you have as you um, get into grafting in your practice. The EpiGuide on the left here is the most popular membrane we have. It's a fully synthetic membrane. Um, like Dr. Kosinski mentioned, he's actually the one that introduced us to this product. He's been using it for, um, sounds like almost 10 years. Uh, great product. It's a big sheet. Uh, so when you're looking at the pricing, I think it's an 18 by 30 millimeter size. Um, and a lot of doctors do cut it to uh, cut it to size or um, cut it into two individual membranes. Um, mentioned a couple more things here quickly before the Q&A. We didn't go over this, but this is a good product for um, controlling bleeding. It's a hemostatic uh, gauze. Uh, I know um, a lot of our customers use this as an alternative to gel foam. It's not expensive. I think it's around uh, $60 for the, the whole pack here of uh, 20 uh, individual packets of the gauze. Uh, really great to control bleeding, prevent tri socket. Um, just an overall great product if you're not going to grafting a site. Um, or maybe if you have a bleeder, this is something to take a look at. I, it's also another very popular product. I just wanted to mention it. Uh, since we didn't cover in the webinar this evening. So like I said, a lot of doctors join our webinars on a regular basis. I'm going to go over just really quickly here before the Q&A. Uh, we did launch some new products recently. Um, these are going to be more your conventional instrumentation, um, but they look very nice. We did make, obviously, there's some improvements. They're titanium coated. They're lighter weight. Um, they have really nice serrations on the beaks. But these are your conventional, like 150, 151s, um, your, your ash. And uh, some different instruments like this, where obviously, um, you know, the physics forceps may not, you know, work, I guess, in every case. Uh, we do have a, a nice line of conventional instruments um, to take a look at. This is something new that we added based on the request of our customers. Um, they look really great. They're like a gunmetal uh, finish. And we've had uh, good feedback on those thus far. Um, Luxators. So we recently added the Luxators. Um, this is just, again, another pre-step if anybody's interested in uh, luxating a little bit prior to using the physics forceps. Um, I think a lot of people are already familiar with the luxators. They're, they are sold in the market by uh, you know several different sellers in the market. And uh, these are the original luxators that we, we went ahead and added. And I think it's a good pre-step sometimes to use uh, prior to the physics forceps just to ensure you have a completely atraumatic extraction and you preserve the, uh, the tissue. Um, these are the most popular ones. We just carry the uh, seven most popular luxators. And um, again, something that we have now, I just want to make everybody aware of that. And then I think lastly here, totally off subject, but again, awesome product. I want to mention it. If you haven't already got you know, the, the 25 or 30 emails <laughs> we've sent on this, I, I do apologize. This is another great product that's uh, been doing very, very well since uh, November of last year. Um, this is our new sectional matrix system. The real key benefit is the ring. Um, it's a plastic ring, and the whole kit is only around uh, 247 for the entire intro kit, which is um, a really great, great price for um, doing a, uh, your, your posterior class two composites. 
Um, a lot of doctors on the uh, line or on the webinar this evening may uh, look at this picture of the ring here and say, well, that looks like my ring. This is one that we actually took a picture of that was only 10 days old. It's a popular brand. And um, I, I know a lot of doctors get, get fed up with that where the ring might be worn out, uh, look uh, old or nasty or discolored. And it's maybe not something you want to put in the patient's mouth if it, if it does look like this. And that's one of the great benefits of the green ring we have here where doctors are using them around five to 10 times, autoclaving them and just tossing them. They're, they're inexpensive rings, but they still give you that perfect separation and uh, tight contacts you need. So I just wanted to mention that again, totally off topic, but why I have everybody on the uh, line this evening, I wanted to mention that. And uh, I guess I lied, I apologize. This last one here too, this is something totally new for us. Um, we actually are sourcing the uh, metal from uh, the same sources, a lot of the top brands like PDT and Euphrates. Um, but these instruments, they're like $20 scalers. Uh, again, we had our first batch come in and they're immediately, uh, we actually sold a lot of them. I think some more are coming in in the next two days. Uh, we've had good success with these. Um, these are our new uh, hygiene scalers and curettes. Um, if anybody's looking to upgrade the instruments for the, the hygiene staff, this is also something else um, we added. That's a real high quality product, looks, looks awesome. Um, and again, great feedback comparing it to the other top brands in the market. Lastly, uh, Amplified Dental Training. This is our uh, educational course. Uh, Dr. Kaczynski already kind of mentioned this. I'll just go through a couple quick slides here. Um, if you want to learn the foundation for, uh, for dental implants, it, it all starts with extractions and grafting, and it's live patients. So our next one's coming up October 25th and 26th here in Detroit. Um, I think we, have, we still have some seats open for that program here in about a month. And um, I'll just keep this up on the screen and I will turn it back over to Lauren to start getting through uh, some of the questions for Dr. Kaczynski this evening. Thanks, everybody. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, Tim, are you ready for some questions here? I am ready, ready, ready. Okay. Um, some of the questions came in maybe before you had gotten to some of this, but I want to try to get to as many of these as we can. Um, what brand of implants do you place? Do you like Han implants? And if so, why? Okay. Um, yeah, you know, I do a lot of, of Han implants. Uh, Jack Han is a dear friend. You know, he was the inventor of the uh, Nobel BioCare Replace implant, which was the number one implant in the world. Um, he redesigned the implant uh, with, with consulting with, with Dr. Mish, uh, Carl Mish, who, who passed away several years ago. And um, it's a very innovative um, implant, um, very, very aggressive threads. Uh, gives me great initial stability, uh, and to be honest, I, I'm not. I, I hate to do a commercial, but uh, what's nice, it's a very economical implant, very very high quality, and the the lab work uh, with the implant department at Glidewell Lab is is second to none. Um, they're very very innovative. Uh, I am a key opinion leader with them, um, so I have a little bit of bias. So it's a wonderful wonderful implant uh, to get involved with. I know um, I am giving programs all over the country, and they give you a really nice. Um, they give you the surgical kit and some implants to get started. Um, I also placed uh, the Strawman implant, uh, which is um, you know a high end um, uh, uh, implant that that has worked very well in my practice too. Okay. Um, if someone's using the physics forceps and they notice from time to time they get ulcers on the gingiva where the bumper was, uh, what advice would you give them? You know, the physics forceps is, is interest, interesting. And as I said in, several times in the program, uh, I wouldn't practice without it. I say that honestly. Um, however, there is a learning curve. And unfortunately, um, in, in teaching the programs, you know, with Kurt and um, Dr. Nazarian for so many years, um, there is a learning curve with it, and we have a tendency, our muscle memory when we want to extract is to squeeze, is to put as much force onto those handles as you can. And what's different about this system, it truly is a luxator and not a forcep, and you don't want to squeeze. So if you're getting ulceration, is because you're using the instrument improperly, and you're just putting too much pressure. You, you, the pressure should be on the lingual or palatal aspect of the root, not on the facial aspect of the center of rotation of the bumper. Okay. Uh, for some of the, I think it was, I guess it must have been a question about the lower extractions. You don't ever use a cow horn for, for some of those? You can. Um, uh, actually, uh, Dr. Golden created a really magnificent cow horn that, that is a little bit um, um, more bow-legged, I guess uh, we could say. 
the 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 um, uh, horn part of it are much longer. So uh, a cow horn is great. Again, my intention, Lauren, is always to create a socket where I'm maintaining the facial plate of bone as possible. It's not always possible, but um, when I have a waffle cone or an ice cream cone. That makes my job really easy and the predictability is much easier. I don't have to reflect. I don't have to, to invest in a membrane. So um, a cow horn is great. I do use a cow horn periodically, but I find that uh, on the lower molars, I just section them and take them out as two individual roots. It's, it takes me a matter of seconds and um, I know I'm going to get those teeth out very, very simply and easily, especially if they're divergent roots. Okay. Um, just to follow up to the, que the previous question about the bumper, um, we have Matt Lark on the call who invented the bumper, and he says it works. So <laughs> that is literally from the horse's mouth. <laughs> Hi, Matt. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see here. We got a bunch here. Um, uh, I want to get to as much as, as we can. At what point do you remove the sutures? I, you know, that's a, that's a great question, and and um, we, the the sutures that I like to use are Vicro, which are are resorbable sutures, but they take about three weeks to resorb. Lauren, I've been doing this a long time, and and I like to bring my patients back in seven, ten days at the most. And the reason I say that is, um, it, you have to remind the patient that, again, epithelium is going to grow a half a millimeter to a millimeter a day. If you don't get primary closure, it's just going to take time. And if you don't tell the patients about the sutures or have them come back, um, they will do really, really well for like the first four days or so. And if you don't tell them, oftentimes they will call and they'll say, uh, tell the doctor, I was doing great and something's wrong because it's starting to bother me. And what's happening is the epithelium wants to close and the sutures are preventing it from closing. I routinely like to see my patients back in seven to 10 days to remove the sutures. They are resor resorbable. Um, however, um, I just like to, to manage my patients that way. I've always done it that way. and It's worked very well in my hands. Okay. Um, here's a interesting question. I think you talked about reflecting a flap when placing an immediate implant, uh, post extraction. Um, but there are some literature out there where they say you shouldn't, uh, reflect the flap. I mean, how do you kind of determine what's the right thing to do? When well, it comes to immediate know, implants. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question because I, I I hear that a lot. And um, number one, when I'm making my reflection, we we talked about the envelope so that I have complete control. So I have blood supply on the mesial distal aspect. I'm not cutting into mucosa, so I'm not creating prostaglandin or releasing prostaglandins and histamines, which are it's very uncomfortable with a lot of swelling. Number two. If I have a defect, I have to be able to see it to fix it. Uh, no different than a root canal, right? A molar root canal. We can all do molar root canals, but we don't take the time to get the access uh, proper so that we can see all the canals. If we can see the canals, we can normally fill the canals. And so I've had been doing this for 35 years. I've had tremendous success uh, with, with tissue control, emergence profile. If I'm not sure, Lauren, I got to see it, and 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 that's just been my approach. Okay, um, really good question here about um, about diagnosis. Um, as you well know, Tim, I mean, cone beam is all the rage, and you know, there's certainly some great images there. But you know, for 40, 50 years, we were placing implants with, without that, and uh, obviously, I mean, as much as cone beam is great, not everyone's got 50 to 100k to to drop on a cone beam machine, so. What's your, your thoughts on that? Uh, you know, if someone can't really af afford a, a CBCT, you know, can they still properly diagnose and, you know, plan the implant without that type of a diagnostic tool? It's great. That's a great question. So, so the issue is, is CBCT analysis standard of care. And we know standard of care is a legal term, not a dental term. And uh, you know the the answer to the question is you only need a CBCT when you need a CBCT um, when something goes wrong. So certainly in our training, I can teach you how to place implants two dimensionally, um, but there are situations that are very difficult where I think the the tool of a CBCT is is important. Um, the the having a CT CBCT in your office is not standard of care. 
because you can always have one done. There are plenty of centers. There are, are mobile units that will come to your office. So again, the, the answer to the question is a nutshell is you only need it when you need it, when you screwed up. And if, you, if something happened and you didn't do it, then you're gonna be questioned on, on why. Um, and not because I don't have one, I didn't want to put $100,000 into one in my office is, is not a good um, defense at all. So it's a tool. It's a tool that makes us more efficient and proficient. Um, do I use it in every situation? No, I don't need it in every situation, but I need it when I need it. Great question. Okay. Uh, there's a question here about uh, the recording, which I can answer. Uh, this webinar has been recorded as long as you are registered uh, for it, you will be sent the, uh, a link to download the recording. Usually takes about a day or two, but, but it definitely will, will be going out. Well, Lauren, um, I think a couple of questions. Yeah. Lauren, I think you have to send a, a transcript to Congress too, I think. I think that's what you have to do. <laughs> Kidding, that's <laughs> I can let that go. Sorry. Yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. A um, couple of questions about PRF. Do you ever incorporate PRF into your grafting? And can PRF be used mixed with human bone without any membrane in the soccer graft? Do we always need a membrane for a soccer graft? Yeah, it is. That, you know what, Lauren, that's awesome because we ran out of time. And um, that was the next thing that I was going to show. So, so we, yeah, we spin, spin a lot of blood. Um, and and uh, PRF, platelet-rich fibrin, um, is, um, you know, is, is auto autologous platelets and leukocytes in a fibrin matrix. It's, it's my membrane. I can create a membrane from the patient's own blood. And uh, the advantage of it is um, we, we get proteins, um, protein growth factors, um, uh, vascular growth factors um, that will stimulate bone growth faster, okay? And I didn't have, we didn't have time today. That, that might be an interesting webinar in the future, Lauren, if, if you if Yeah, so I agree. One. Um, but it, it is, it is a, a valuable asset uh, in my practice um, to draw blood and to spin it. Um, and you're going to get faster, a faster result. So the answer to your question is yes. Um, I, I, I love it because you don't have to invest in a, in a membrane. What I wanted to demonstrate today was, was the more standard techniques where you're, you're basically pulling things off the shelf. Yes, we can use allograft material. Yes, we can build walls with, um, with the allograft material, protecting it from invagination of epithelium. And finally, yes, we will get a faster turnover of bone when we use um, the patient's own uh, platelet-rich materials, um, either plasma or fibrin materials, um, uh, if we incorporate that into our graft material. Okay. Uh, let's see. You showed a case, I guess, with um, when you're talking about conventional grafting versus osteogen. What was the implant diameter? Do you recall for that particular case? Uh, they were bicuspids, uh, so I would say three five uh, diameter. Um, and I and okay. the length is determined by the apices, the adjacent teeth, adjacent roots. Okay. Is um, are smokers contraindicated for for grafting, or if not, uh, how did that affect the healing period that you'd have well, them on? You know, smokers are just a, a problem. And um, if if you have a smoker, obviously we have less blood supply; they don't bleed as much. Uh, and and stopping smoking a week or two doesn't really matter. The half life is 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 years. Um, so if if I do implants and grafting, I I do implants and grafting in smokers. But you must protect it. So in smokers, I would want primary closure, Lauren. Um, I think, mm -hmm. and if you can't get primary closure, at least protect it uh, as much as you can from from the tar and nicotine heat generated from the the site, and also allow more healing time uh, because the blood supply just isn't as as um, effective as in a as in a non-smoker. Great question. Okay, what about? Um... Surgical guides for implants. Do you use any guides, and if so, what type? Absolutely. Surgical guides are, are wonderful. Again, it's a tool. Um, you know, we, we just did a course in, in Charlotte um, where everybody does a full arch guided case. And I, I like to say that that surgical guides are 80% are, uh, accurate 80% of the time. And the guide's um, uh, efficacy is only as good as the person that is creating it. 
Um, and any small error in, in a surgical guide can create a huge error in the mouth intraorally. So again, it's a tool that, that helps us in diagnosing, uh, cuts down the surgical time dramatically, but I think it's imperative that doctors understand that you have to be in control of, of the surgical site completely, um, and you cannot rely on the, on the guide 100% of the time, um, um, because if you're off, uh, it can really cause some problems for you. So it's a tool that makes us better, I agree. Yes, and I do do a lot okay. of guides. For grafting, what about, you know, I've, I've seen, as you may have shown some cases, where were you ground up the, the tooth rather than using uh, allografted materials? Any experience with that or any thoughts about using yeah, a yeah, ground-up tooth? They're, 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 yeah, we, we've done that. Um, and what's nice about it is you're creating your own graft material. You process your own graft material from the roots of teeth. Um, you know, it, it, it's a very effective. And again, the turnover is very, very fast. Um, um, and I think, I think Kurt with Golden Dent um, sells a great, a great product that we published on. Um, it's, it's another way of, of doing the same thing uh, without having to invest in, in something off the shelf. Okay. What about, you had mentioned um, the need to have two millimeters of bone beyond the apex. If you don't have it, can you place an immediate implant, like say in a premolar site, so you can get some type of stability with uh, the mesial and distal walls of the osteotomy? Well, that, that, that's great. You know, I, the initial stability of any implant system is in the apical two millimeters. That's where you're getting your stability. So, so I didn't necessarily say extend beyond it. Um, so depending on the anatomy of the tooth, um, you, you want initial stability as possible, or you have to allow more time for integration to uh, progress. I can put an implant in with zero torque and it will heal, but it may take six months. Um, so the, the stability is created by the design and, and most implants today are, are um, tapered. You know, they're shaped like the root of a tooth. Um, again, the, I guess what I would like to leave you with is think tooth first rather than putting this, this screw or the spark plug in the jaw. Uh, if you start thinking tooth first, your successes are going to be much greater. Great question. Okay. Uh, who sells the uh, Lindemann Burr? Um, you can probably get that through Salvin Dental out of Charlotte, S-A-L-V-I-N Dental out of Charlotte, North Carolina. They only sell implant okay. products. Okay. Um, when you use an oxygen plug, do you charge the patient for the membrane and bone graft? No. We would just charge for the, for the graft itself. You know, what's nice about the oxygen, you know, oftentimes, you know, I hear, well, patients don't want me to graft. And remember... You know, if you don't if you don't preserve the socket, bone is going to shrink. It's physiologic. How much I don't know. So um, I'm I'm always thinking preserve the bone for future implant. You know, that's the most financial rewarding thing that I do in my practice. And so you know, when when Kurt said it's a forty or fifty dollar um, uh, material that you don't need a membrane for, um, you know, you can reduce the fee dramatically in using that. Okay. How about if you have you ever tried, for example, say to re use like a surgical piezo to remove a tooth? Absolutely. Um, we have a great new piezo. It's called the Cube from Action. Again, through Salvin Dental. Uh, just a phenomenal. Looks cool. Um, yes, I'll use a piezo to remove teeth. I'll use a piezo to do my Caldwell Lux or to do ridge splitting. Yes. Okay. Uh, will the Osteogen plug work for a defect? Um, you, you know, we're doing a lot of research on that right now. So, you know, my thought process is if you have um, greater than a four millimeter, you know, I, we tried to focus on defects, sockets where all the walls were intact and sockets where the facial wall was missing. So, so if the facial defect is four millimeters or less, I think the acid gen plug is great. If it's greater than four millimeters, I strongly recommend you use a long lasting resorbable membrane to protect it. Okay. So if you have a, a defect and you've got some allograft material in there, isn't there a possibility that's going to prevent complete seating of the implant? And if so, how do you deal with that? No, it, it'll, it'll turn over. No, that's not my experience at all, Lauren. Okay. Uh, do you have to use the EpiGuide membrane when using the PRF membrane? Not in this, no, you don't. If you have a PRF, that can be your 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 primary membrane per se. Yes, so, but sometimes I use both. 
you know, it depends on what I'm trying to create. But no, the PRF, if you get enough of it, that is my long lasting membrane, physiologic membrane. Okay. Have you ever used like a magnetic mallet to extract? No, never done that. Okay. So you can't compare that to Piso since you've never done it. So. Yeah. Uh, does Golden Dental have like a tooth delivery instrument that Dr. K speaks about all the time? Yes, they do. Yeah. Okay. I think, you know, we're, we're at the bottom of the hour here and I want to be respectful of people's time. I, I hopefully had mentioned at the beginning, I think I did at the mention that we do our best to get to as many questions as we can. And I do apologize if there were, were a few questions here that we couldn't get to, but uh, we know your time is valuable. Uh, so Tim, why don't you uh, close it down and uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, future webinars. Well, th thanks, Lauren. I, I truly appreciate you. Um, I, we've done so many programs uh, together and I think uh, I really, really enjoy sharing what I do. As I said, there's a hundred ways of doing what I do. What I wanted to demonstrate are things that work for me predictably, are financially rewarding. It's a lot of fun. We see a lot of patients. And what I want to leave the, the attendees, we had a big group listening today, and I, and I truly appreciate it, is you are all capable of, of doing this. Just, just educate yourself um, and, and uh, continue to grow and be successful. Well, thank you. And as I, as I mentioned at the top of the, the webinar, one of the reasons I enjoy doing these with you is that I'm learning something new every time. It's not like you're just regurgitating the same stuff over and over again. It's always new cases, always new content. And I think that's why we always get, you know, a thousand plus people on these webinars because they know they're going to learn something new. And we really appreciate uh, you, uh, you know, and, and your involvement in this whole process. Uh, thanks again to Golden Dent for their sponsorship. As I said, we, you know, we just couldn't do it without them, and we're, we're so appreciative of that. Uh, Kurt uh, has always been given great specials. When he says, hey, this special is good through tomorrow, that means don't call on Friday and be surprised that you can't get the special. It, it, it's definitely a short-term special, but um, take advantage of it. They have a, a fantastic return policy. You won't be disappointed. We've had so many clients that are that are also Golden Den clients, and we, they just rave about the products and the customer service, and we are, are thrilled to be working with them. We do this on a regular basis, as Tim said. You know, he's got enough content that he could go hours and hours, so we'll uh, we'll corral him to do another one sometime in the next month or two. And uh, we we know that uh, your time is valuable, and hopefully you you all got something out of it this evening. And we really look forward to seeing everyone on future webinars. So good night, everyone. Good night, Lauren. Good night, Kurt.